evening, we will get started. Welcome to the first session in the 2024 webinar series for St. John's College. This session is an introduction to university and to Cambridge in particular. Um, it's a pleasure to launch this webinar series again this year. And my name is Elsie. I'm the school's liaison and access officer here at St. John's College in Cambridge. I'm currently coming to you live from the old divinity school in St. John's. Um, and I will include my email at various points uh, in the in the session slides, and you will have received emails from me before uh, about this uh, this webinar series, no doubt. Um, please do get in touch with me, basically, if you have any questions at all about the webinar series or about Cambridge University more generally. Uh, coming up in today's session, then. So first of all, I'm going to touch on the webinar program as a whole and go through what each of the sessions will focus on. Um, and then we're gonna look at university generally and what it's like to go to university, to study at university. And then we're gonna focus in a little bit on Cambridge um, and think about the application process as well as the student experience as well. And then we'll end with um, some questions. So please do pop any questions that you have during the session in the Q&A box, in the Zoom Q&A box, and then I will come back and review them at the end of the session. Um, thank you. Yes, let's get started. So my email is, is there at the, at the bottom left. You will receive a copy of these slides um, and a recording of this, um, this presentation. Let me just double check that I am recording. Yes, good. My only options are to pause or stop the recording. So that's, that's a good sign. Um, these recordings will be uploaded shortly after each webinar session has ended. Um, and you can rewatch them or watch them if you miss them, um, if you would like. Okay, so first of all, let me test my Zoom knowledge and launch a poll. Uh, basically, please respond with who you are, just in the sense of which year group you're in, um, or whether you're a supporter, a teacher, um, an advisor for higher education applicants. Just helps me get a sense of who I'm talking to because I cannot see you all because of the way that the webinar works. Okay, interesting. We have um, the vast majority of you are year 12, uh, no year 13s, and I have some year 10s and year 11s, and no HE advisors or teachers or supporters. Okay, that's all I needed to know. Thank you very much to everyone who responded there. So that helps me think about framing things uh, towards year 12 students, but it minded that we also have year 10s and year 11s here as well. That's great. You're all very welcome. Thank you very much for responding to my poll. Okay, I've ended the poll and I shall move on to look at the overview of all of the sessions that are coming up. So today is that first one that you can see there uh, in January. The next one that we have coming up is an absolutely fantastic session that I think is the session to go to live, if you can, to attend uh, while it's running, I mean, on, on Zoom. Um, this session in February is the, I, I, I just hand over to the students, sensing that after one session, you'll have already had enough of my voice. Um, it's, a, it's a student Q&A panel in February. We have around half a dozen students um, who are really keen to answer your questions about applying and studying um, here at St. John's at Cambridge. So come prepared to next month's session with your questions for the students. Then in March, we focus in on um, a webinar that is specifically designed for years 11 and 12 and anyone supporting students in those years. But you are welcome to come along if you're outside that, that sort of bracket, as it were. Um, this one focuses on choosing your course. So just the, the process of deciding the subject or, or subjects that you're going to be studying at university, your UCAS choices, your subject choices. Um, I hope that this will be quite a useful session for you, particularly if you are still quite undecided. But I think it's also helpful, even if you think you're pretty much certain on what you want to study. I think it can provide some useful reflections um, on that decision that is really important and is a decision that only you can make for yourself. Uh, and then the April session, this is a really good one for thinking about exploring your subject, how you can do that, and how you can do that really effectively as well. Because I'm sure 
naturally, if you're interested in the subject, you're already doing what we call super curricular exploration, right? You're already exploring around your subject because it's what you find most interesting. But this session really gives you a sort of a toolkit to use to do this to the best of your ability. And then in May, um, this again is a focus session targeted at years 11s and uh, year 11s and 12s. And it's looking at a slightly different angle, um, the potential connections that there can be between different degree choices, different courses that you study at university, the qualifications you get, and careers, what you do after university in that sort of um, connection sense. And also we look at the schemes of financial support that are available to university students as well. A, a really informative session, I, I hope. Um, so yeah, well worth coming to. If you have any questions or thoughts about careers and financial support, then, then that's a dedicated session for that. The one in June um, specifically focused uh, for year 12s, because around that point, if you're in year 12, um, if you're applying for Oxbridge, if you're applying for universities of Oxford or Cambridge, you will be putting together your application around then in the summer, um, ready to submit um, for the early October deadline. We will cover this uh, shortly in today's session. So that is a really focused session looking specifically at the application process for uh, Cambridge and Oxford and how to really make the make the most competitive application that you can. Uh, and then the final webinar, um, I really like this one. Uh, it's our personal statements workshop. Again, specifically focused for year 12 students and indeed anyone who's supporting uh, students in year 12 because it's around that time in, in the summer um, in, in, in that stage of your application journey, so to speak, that you'll really be focused on personal statements. But spoiler, I think the key takeaway from that one is that personal statements are important, yes, but they are one element of the application process. And I also hope that the takeaway message is that the personal statement is a really useful exercise for you, helping you do all of the super curricular subject choice competitive application making that we will have covered in the previous session. So it's a nice one to end on, I think. Um, so that's what's coming up, um, and I hope you'll join me for um, as many of those webinar sessions as you will find useful and interesting. Today's session aims, some learning objectives for you, um, to learn more about university and why you might like to go. So we're really starting at that sort of uh, broad foundation level of thinking about higher education. And then we will look a bit more closely at what sets Cambridge and also Oxford apart from other universities, both in terms of what you can study, how you study, um, and also how you apply. Um, this is also a great session where you can ask questions. So we will have time for that at the end. Um, I need to keep a track on time in order to give enough uh, enough of a Q&A portion for you all. Um, and then, yeah, just generally thinking about your choices. So like I said earlier, that decision of what you end up studying at university is your decision. Um, that's the sort of the real key message here. I think it, it, the, this whole webinar series is designed to support you um, if you're thinking about applying or indeed if you're supporting a student who will be applying to universities like Cambridge. So let's keep the pace up because I do have a tendency to to ramble I've started with again that broad foundational beginning as I mentioned so what is university well I've got a, a definition for you here so it's a higher education institution um, you might hear it called uni as well uh, so uni is essentially a place where students are studying for a degree for a course for their qualification um, and the academics that are researching at that university are the ones teaching those students. So that's why I've bolded those verbs there in my definition, because I think it's uh, it's a really, I mean, it, it, for me, it's the, um, it's the best part of, of university is that the academics who are researching in your subject are teaching you. Um, I think that's a really key message um, that I wanted to bring out. We have on the left uh, there some logos, some crests of various UK universities. Um, there are around 160, last Google that I did, um, around 160. Uh, and there are, broadly speaking, three types. Now, I don't want to be a university essentialist here and say that every university has to fit very neatly into one of these three categories. But broadly speaking, I think these categories do help to think about university. If you're not particularly familiar with universities, if, perhaps if you don't know anyone who's been to university, um, or if you don't 
live near or you've never been to visit uh, a university, then I think this is a useful categorization. Uh, a campus university, basically a bit like a school campus where everything is on site. Um, that's what a campus university is a bit like. So an example of that is the University of Warwick, um, where you have everything, teaching, uh, student halls, accommodation and eating and socializing tends to be all in one campus. There might be multiple campuses. Um, so that's broadly speaking what a campus university is like. A city university is a little bit different. So an example could be um, the University of Manchester. Uh, here, the university buildings, lecture halls, accommodation for the students, etc., will be sort of dotted around uh, the pre-existing city buildings. So a little bit different, less concentrated, perhaps, in terms of like a geographical space that the university is taking up. And then the third category, collegiate, I like to think of this as a combination of the other two categories. So campus and city combined. Collegiate here it means made up of colleges. And the prime examples of collegiate universities are Oxford and Cambridge. We will look a little bit later in today's session at what I mean by a Cambridge or Oxford college. But essentially, it's like a mini campus and there are lots of different colleges, about 30 in each of Oxford and Cambridge respectively. Um, and these colleges at Oxford and Cambridge are like mini campuses basically dotted around the city, but we'll cover that in a little bit more detail later. So what is going to university like? This is a question that I remember asking um, quite a while ago now for me. And also I get this question um, very, very regularly. So I wanted to, compile some thoughts and reflections and some responses that I have from current students um, and yeah, also my own thoughts really and reflections. The first one that I wanted to put down was independence because it really is up to you. When you go, whether you go, what you study, where everything is, is independence in both life and learning as I've put there, um, it's your choice. You, when you go to university will be crossing paths with people that you may never have encountered. And then the ideas and the the uh, the topics and questions that come up because of that, that broadening of horizons is a really wonderful part of university, I think, is that you will meet friends for life there. You will think about things in a completely different way, um, but just because you will meet loads of different people from all over the country, all over the world. You can also, it's not just about studying, you can also do lots of things at university that are really enriching. Um, you can be involved in societies and clubs, either on a participatory level, going to the events um, that they put on, or uh, and or on an administrative level where you're organising the events that the society or, or club um, puts on. You can also do lots of volunteering. Um, you can be involved in community projects as well, wherever the university is based. So there are lots of opportunities to continue with things that you already know that you love to do in your spare time, any hobbies that you have, but also try out loads of new New, um, new things to do, new sports, new, new hobbies. It might be a good question to make a note of to ask the students in February's webinar because um, they're all involved in so many things outside of studying. Um, the next one I've got on this slide, what's going to university like? You get to study your favourite subject. And I think that seems really obvious, um, but I wanted to put it there because, again, this is a bit of personal reflection for me. I remember... GCSEs to A-levels in terms of the UK uh, education system, you have to study lots of subjects, then you get to pick a few, and then if you choose to go to university, you really are picking the subjects that really make you tick, they really pique your curiosity, they're, they're what you find most interesting. Um, so I think that's a really important point. You also gain lots of transferable skills or soft skills, they're sometimes called, or life skills. Um, you can definitely gain these sorts of skills, these transferable skills outside of university. Um, but I think that university is a great way of gaining and honing these transferable skills. Certainly, if you'd asked me to do what I'm doing right now before I went to university, which is communicating live to an audience of almost 100, um, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So things like communication, things like time management, these important life skills, university can really help you develop those. Uh, flexible and fits you. What I mean by that is a bit like what I was saying earlier with the independence, you can choose to go 
uh, after you finish school, uh, after you've had a job, if you want to get a, a different qualification and retrain in order to enter a new industry or, or, or forge forward on a different career path. Some university courses let you study remotely as well. Um, and some university courses you can study part time or full time. So that flexibility is something to bring out, I think, as well, when we're thinking about what university is like. And then finally, we'll be looking at this a bit more today. Um, but the teaching methods, the teaching and learning at university for students, it's really varied. You will do a lot of learning independently. You will do a lot of self self study. You will also do a lot of learning in groups, discussion, collaborative problem solving, presenting your ideas and seminars and classes, thinking about things in a very different way, practically putting experiments and field work together, uh, the reports for those as well, doing longer form research in uh, for dissertations, for coursework. There are lots of different ways of learning, basically, when you're studying for a degree at university. Okay, what is my next slide? What is Oxbridge? So I might have used this term already a couple times. Apologies if you aren't familiar. I will explain it now. Um, so essentially, it's what we use, the term that we use, to refer to both Oxford and Cambridge in a quick way. Um, we pair them together like this because they are connected in their history. They are very similar in the, the courses available and also how you apply, um, but they, they are also different. Um, so I wanted to put the similarities and differences on this slide for you. Essentially, they're both academically competitive universities. Um, they're connected through their history as well. They have a long tradition um, of things like matriculation, um, which is where you wear um, formal black gowns uh, to, in order to officially enter into the university. That's what you do when you, when you first start. There's also opportunities for you to do things like formal halls, which again is when you put on your, your academic gown with all of your fellow students and you have a lovely, uh, a lovely meal in college. There are lots of traditions that go along with the history. Uh, a little point, um, Oxford was founded before Cambridge. If anyone ever asks you that in a, in a quiz, um, now you know the answer. Um, they both have world leading researchers um, belonging to these institutions. And the way that they are most similar in the sense of the student experience, I think is the supervision system, as we call it at Cambridge and the tutorial system, which is what we call it at Oxford. Supervisions and tutorials are essentially the same thing. For humanities subjects, this would mean when you have your supervision or tutorial, you will have written um, an answer to a prompt essay question, or you will have analyzed a passage um, or a source text, something, and you will come ready with that answer to discuss it led by an academic. And you'd be discussing with one or two other students maximum. So when I say small group discussion, I really do mean small group. Um, for the sciences, for maths-based, uh, science-based courses, um, your tutorial or supervision would be very similar in the sense that you're discussing and collaborating in a very small group of students. You would have worked on some maths problems, some science problems um, prior to the supervision, and you will then discuss how you solve them or indeed how, where you where you were stuck with them and you will solve them together, led by the academic. So they're similar in the sense that they both do that way of teaching, um, but they're different because they have different terminology. Some other things that I haven't mentioned then, uh, the collegiate system, we'll, we'll touch on that in, in just a second. They both have colleges. They're both made up of colleges. St. John's College um, at Cambridge is where I'm from. There's also a St. John's College at Oxford as well. Um, blue, what I mean by blue in the similarities is that, um, well, I guess the background of my slide is kind of like a Cambridge blue. I think my inadvertently my nails are sort of a Cambridge blue today. Um, the Oxford blue is a very different blue, if you ask me. It's a dark blue. It's like the one I've got in the top left there. So they both like the colour blue, but they both have very different ideas about what blue actually is. So I like to put that on the similarities column. The differences, the location is really important. So sometimes people assume that they are close together. Um, they're not, uh, they're not close together. They are both in, in, in the south. They're both relatively near London, um, but they are in different places. 
Um, what else do I have there? There are different courses available. So if you want to study veterinary medicine, you can only do that um, at Cambridge as opposed to Oxford and the opposite for fine art. Um, single science courses as well are available at Oxford, but we have our broad natural sciences course at Cambridge within which you specialise and pick which science or science areas you want to study. Um, Cambridge also still has some female female only colleges, so some all female colleges. Um, way back when both universities set up women's only colleges um, to enable women to study at the universities. Uh, now Cambridge is the only one of the two that still has colleges for female only students. Um, this game, just in the interest of time, we will play at the end, uh, provided we have time after questions. Uh, these are just some Cambridge discoveries and inventions, and I'm just interested to see if you can think of what the images represent, but we will come back to that. And if you're watching on YouTube, I will try and put the answers in the in the, in the in the box below or something. I don't know. I'm not a YouTuber, sorry. Right. What are Cambridge colleges like then? So they are these mini campuses, as I described earlier. They're essentially your home when you're a student at Oxford or Cambridge. Um, they're a home in that physical sense where you live, sleep, eat, do most of your studying and socialising, um, but they're also more of your pastoral home as well. You will have welfare support from members of staff in college, financial support and academic support is also available to each individual student when they need it as well from the college in the first instance. So it's really that network, that home network of support while you're a student here. They are all very different in how they look, and the history of them and how big they are and where they are in the city. Um, St. John's is a central college. We, we go across the, the river, the River Cam. Um, whichever college you end up studying at, uh, you will ultimately uh, do the same degree, get the same degree at the end of it. You'll have done the same course as everyone else, all the different colleges studying that subject, that course. Um, because it's the university, the colleges as a collective, that decides the content of the course, the lectures, the exams, etc. There is a really helpful web page um, about college choice that I would encourage you to, to, to look over. It's got some really helpful factors to consider when thinking about which Cambridge or Oxford college you might want to apply to. And also, equally helpfully, some factors not to bring into consideration as well. So do have a look at that web page for more information. These two slides, I hope, represent how the departments, so the subject faculty buildings and the colleges, the students' homes and, and mini campuses all come together to form the university as a collective, as this collegiate whole. I've got a, a quick screenshot, not of the whole of Cambridge by any means, but just um, a central snapshot of the city. Um, I've got St. John's in the center there. You can see how large we are um, with our playing fields and um, all the way across the other side uh, with Old Divinity School, where I am right now. You also have lots of other colleges dotted around uh, and you can spot hopefully the university library down here and also the maths faculty up there. So I hope this gives a sense if you've not been to Cambridge or Oxford before and you've not seen sort of the layout of these of these very much university towns, university cities, um, this does give you a sense. You can access this map um, on your own. You don't need to log in. You just need to type in Cambridge University map and it should come up for you. And in the follow up email after this webinar, I'll also send you a link to the virtual tour for Cambridge University, which is a really great way to um, to have a look around at virtually. So St. John's College, a few facts. I think we have a rather interesting history, not least because we were founded in 1511 by who would be the mother of King Henry the seventh. But I think a little bit more interestingly, we're actually the birthplace of football because a student who arrived here in the 1840s was not content with how each college, each student uh, even, was playing football in a completely different way to everyone else. No one could decide on how to play this game. This, this person called John, funnily enough, John Thring, uh, he came up with the Cambridge rules, as they're now known, which the FA then took on um, and has kind of formed the basis of the game that we know today. So I think that's a really, really fun fact. 
Um, we're a very large community. Uh, we're a physically large space, but we're also a, a large, really big bustling college with around 170 new students every year. Um, we have the biggest college library in the, the, the biggest area of college grounds and lots of clubs and societies that are run by our students, as well as music practice rooms, a gym. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic college. And next month, when we have the student Q&A panel, um, please do ask some questions about what the students most enjoy about being uh, being at St John's. So what can you study at Cambridge? So I've got just a screenshot here uh, of the course page on our website. I will link all of these pages um, either through the slides or in my email that I send to you all after the session. Um, we've got an A to V um, of, the, of the courses. Some you may have heard of before. Some of you might even know which ones you're thinking of applying for. Um, but essentially what I wanted to focus on on this slide is the fact that we have around 30 courses, but they're really broad and flexible. So whilst we don't have a specific zoology course or a specific aerospace engineering course, what we do have is we have our natural sciences course and our engineering course. And you can study those specific subtopics, those specific academic areas within um, our courses. So aerospace engineering is a topic, a module that you could pick in the engineering course. And zoology is a, a, an option, a module that you can pick within the biological sciences streams of natural sciences, our broad science course. So if you want that sort of A to Z, I think it is aerospace engineering all the way through to zoology. I'm gonna look very silly if it isn't because I often use those two examples, but the A to Z um, you can access just by clicking this link. So that's all of the subject areas. And then under each subject area, there's about 65 of them. And um, you'll see which Cambridge course teaches that subject area. So for aerospace engineering, it'll be engineering. For zoology, it'll be natural sciences. So on this slide, I've got a few groups which I've tried to distinguish in terms of subjects that you might be familiar with versus subjects that you might not be so familiar with and then also subjects that um, naturally lead on to a vocation to a career because there are lots of ways to think about these university subject choices and the session in March which focuses on subject choices will um, no doubt reuse this slide <laughs> reuse recycle um, but we will go into a little bit more detail about these different uh, subject choices. But essentially, you can broadly split it up into four categories. So you can choose to study at university a subject that you've enjoyed studying at school and that you feel you know from school. The little asterisk there is just to remind me to say that although you may have studied the subject at school, that's not to say that you, of course, have studied everything that could ever be studied in the subject. And therefore, why would you want to just continue studying it at university? Quite the opposite. Often, you'll find um, quite frustratingly perhaps when you're at school but then quite amazingly when you're at university that the way that the subject is taught that the syllabus the confines of the specification of what you need to learn for your exams um, is, is just a small part of the huge very interdisciplinary so lots of other subjects coming into the uh, the mix there and, and that overlap between different subjects that is how it's taught and studied and researched at a university level, at this higher education level. So even though you might be familiar with the subject at school, the way that you, you learn it and the sorts of things um, you learn you learn about at university will be will be just richer, I think. So that's what the asterisk was prompting me to say. Um, then the purple category, archaeology, linguistics, design, just a few examples of some Cambridge courses that might actually be a subject area that is completely new to you. You may never have studied anything remotely like linguistics at school, um, but by having a look at the course pages that I listed on the previous slide, you can have a think about whether linguistics, if you enjoy learning languages and thinking about how people communicate and the history of languages, um, then linguistics might be something that you would like to consider. And design is our relatively new course in the, um, the, the faculty of architecture um this is a yeah this is a great course for thinking about particularly about how considerations of architects need to take into account 
things like the climate crisis in terms of resources, in terms of materials and design of buildings. So definitely have a look at the design course if that's sort of piqued your interest. It's sort of the overlap between materials, engineering and architecture. Um, so yeah, do have a look at that course page if you're interested. And then I've got uh, the pink category here, a mix of the new and the familiar. So maybe you've studied history at school, but you might not have studied politics. So history and politics is a course that you can study at Cambridge and also lots of other universities. And then you might have studied RE or RS, religious education or religious studies at school. But our theology, religion and philosophy of religion course at Cambridge is that kind of mix of uh, putting different uh, different elements together. So mixing things that you might be familiar with from school to elements that you might not have had the chance to study yet, like philosophy of religion, for instance. Then something vocational is the last category I've got there. Um, some examples include medicine, uh, veterinary medicine, I also could have put there, and engineering. What I mean by vocational is the degree naturally le leads to, um, to a career. So for medicine, it's being a healthcare professional. For veterinary medicine, it's being a vet. So how do you learn at university? I think I've already covered um, quite a few of the teaching and learning methods on my previous slide with all the, the mortarboard hats um, at the start of today's session. But essentially, there are lots of ways that you study at university. And as I said before, sometimes you will be studying on your own. We have a student in one of our undergraduate rooms there reading a textbook. We have two students here in the library um, working on a problem sheet, discussing something. The library is also pictured here. And then we've got students much further afield on field work, trips, archeological digs, um, and then doing a practical experiment in one of the laboratories here in the university for you know, a few hours in the afternoon, collecting results on something that they've been told about in the lecture. So the lecture format is maybe what you're instinctively thinking of when you think of being a university student, because it is the sort of bread and butter of, uh, of uni student life. You go to your lectures, you go to your morning lectures, um, but it's not the only way that you learn. And, and what I've not mentioned so far, these two pictures are, I think, ones that really are brought to the fore when we're thinking about Oxford and Cambridge. They're the supervisions, the tutorials, the seminars, um, these smaller group discussion based sessions as well. I've got some example timetables for you. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. I think I'm doing okay. Um, some example timetables then. The reason I've put this here in the first session is because for some science students in some of the years of their study, they may have Saturday morning lectures. Less so for humanities. It's unlikely for humanities students that you would have lectures um, scheduled for Saturday mornings. Um, but this is just an example to give you a sense of what it's what it's really like. So you can see here that you've got daily lectures, you might have a few supervisions and practicals in the afternoons. And then for humanities, it tends to be fewer contact hours, i.e. Few, fewer sort of scheduled class times, um, but you've got much the same, you've got lectures, you've got different classes and supervisions as well. And one thing that I will mention about supervisions or tutorials is that because it is that small group, not only is that lovely in the sense that you can try out your ideas and collaboratively work through a problem that you've been stuck on for the past week together in a small group led by an expert in that subject. Not only that, but also you're not assessed directly um, on what you say in those supervisions or those tutorials. So it's an excellent way of sort of figuring out how you would approach an argument, what evidence you could bring, what solution you could use to solve a particular problem. There's just a fantastic way. If you thrive in a discussion-based environment, then I think that you should really consider Oxford and Cambridge just purely for the tutorial and supervision system that we offer. Um, and also because it's a small group of you, um, you can often arrange them around your collective availabilities. So I've had in the past some supervisions that are in the afternoon, some in the early evening. You can really just sort of see what time works for, for all of you, both the supervisor or the tutor and the two or three students involved. What I've got on the following slides are some screenshots that I've taken from an example course page. So all universities have course pages, both online and also perhaps in, in printed form in a prospectus. Um, and I hope that these few slides will be helpful to you in knowing what to look for when you're faced with 
quite a lot of information on the screen or on the page. Um, I think it's really useful to know sort of where to look and what information you need to sort of quickly um, gather from, from all of these different course pages that you'll be looking at, because you will hopefully be looking wide in terms of your university choices, in terms of your subject choices. I would urge you to just keep looking at different course pages. Even if you think that a course might uh, teach you a certain thing, do read the course page because history at one university may be very different from history at another university. So these choices about what you study and how you're assessed, you can often find the answers to those on university course pages. So it's really important to not just take the title um, at face value, but to actually really interrogate by looking through the pages on the university website for all of the courses that you're interested in, plus the ones that they recommend at the bottom, a bit like other customers who bought this item also bought this. It's kind of like that. Um, you'll find for uh, Cambridge courses, it's I think it's towards the side of the, of the web page. There are lots of related courses and you might be thinking, yes, I want to study English at university. And then you're looking at the English course at, uh, on the Cambridge website. And you might see in the corner a, a course called Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic, which is a really fascinating course, um, particularly looking at texts like Beowulf and the history and culture and languages and um, the, the, just the whole sort of period of, of history and literature um, from sort of medieval times there for, for ASNAC, as we call it, Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic. So that might be something that you've never even heard of before. Um, I certainly had never heard of it um, when I was in your position as, as school students. So yeah, definitely have a look at the you might like section on course pages. Anyway, what I've got here is um, the, the minimum offer uh, is usually going to be listed as three A-level grades and also some IB equivalents. And then there is usually a link to see what that means for other qualifications as well. Um, Cambridge colleges may have different subject requirements. It might be the case that one college requires you to have a particular subject but other colleges just highly recommend that you have that subject. So it will always make sense. There's never going to be a really strange outlier with these subject requirements, but it's just a useful thing because of the way the university is made up. The colleges are all independent, autonomous institutions, um, so their requirements may differ. But broadly speaking, um, it, they're much the same across all the, all the colleges for all the courses. Um, some courses at Cambridge require applicants to take admissions assessments or maybe submit samples of written work. So there might be an additional requirements section on the course page. The example here, I've been taking these examples from our relatively new course, Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology. Um, so I've got the example of what the admissions test will be for that course there. So make sure you are having a look at what, if any, additional requirements there are for you. We will cover in later webinar sessions more about these admissions assessments. Um, in the On the course pages, in the entry requirements section, you will see uh, what is currently a grey box. Um, this grey box, I think, is fantastically useful because it answers a lot of questions that prospective applicants often have um, in the sense that it gives from recent cohorts of successful applicants, so students who have achieved their, their, their offers and are, you know, have started at the university, it shows you what they got in terms of grades and also which subjects they took as well. So it's really useful, I think, to see how you might fit into the gathered field of applicants for your particular course. So a little about UCAS. Um, you may have heard of UCAS, you may not have heard of UCAS. Essentially, this is the online portal through which you make your university applications. So the universities and colleges admissions service. In UCAS, you have up to five choices. So you, you have five slots to fill, essentially. Um, if you're applying for medicine, veterinary medicine, veterinary science or dentistry courses, then you can only fill four of those slots with medicine or veterinary medicine or dentistry, whichever one you've, you've, you've gone for. Then the fifth one has to be something that isn't that. So it has to be something like biology or maybe pharmacology. Um, so that's an important point at this early stage for you to, um, 
to know if that applies to you for Oxford and for Cambridge and for those medicine, veterinary medicine, dentistry courses at other universities as well. We have this early UCAS deadline. So it's usually the middle of October. Um, it's, it's usually the 15th of October, 6 p.m. UK time. So what that means is you have to submit to all of your university choices, all of those up to five uh, slots that you filled with your course choice, you have to submit um, earlier than other people who aren't applying to Oxford and Cambridge or for those medicine and dentistry vet med courses. Um, importantly as well, you cannot apply for more than one course at Oxford or more than one course at Cambridge. You have to pick either Oxford or Cambridge and within those universities you have to select one course and only one course to apply for. Um, most other universities, but do look at the, their web pages to, to confirm this, but most other universities will let you apply to multiple courses at that one university. So what makes up a Cambridge application then? I'm coming towards the end of my slide, so I should wrap up in the next five, 10 minutes to take your questions. Um, through UCAS, you submit a lot of information. Your teacher uh, writes your reference and submits that through UCAS. You also give us lots of information about your educational and personal history that helps us put your application into important context. You give us your academic record as well, so your achievements in public examinations, like GCSEs, for instance, and also you submit your personal statement, which is essentially a side of A4, speaking about your commitment and your interest in the chosen course area that you want to study at university. So through UCAS, you submit all of that. So we get that at Cambridge, but we also ask you for a little bit more, these ones at the bottom. And the reason that we ask for, for these ones that I've highlighted in green there, um, is because we assess you all as individuals. So everyone who applies to us at Oxford, at Cambridge, you are individually assessed and you are assessed contextually and holistically. So what that means is holistically, every single element you submit to us. So all of these bullet points here, um, we consider everything in, 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 in the whole. We don't look at one thing in a vacuum and make a decision on whether to offer you a place or not on that one single thing. That holistic assessment within the gathered field of applicants within against everyone who has that year applied for that course, that is how we, we assess you. And contextually, we take a little bit more information from you through various forms and questionnaires, and also through these um, admissions assessments, if your course requires one, uh, or written work samples if your course requires one. You can have a look in your own time at the course pages to figure out whether you will ultimately need to take an admissions assessment or submit a sample of written work. But broadly speaking, it tends to be the humanities subjects that have that um, requirement to submit some written work samples, just examples of your classwork essays or a portion of your EPQ, your coursework, something like that. Uh, the admissions assessments, the, the, the main ones that you may, might have heard of are for medicine, so the UCAT, um, for law, LMAT. These are assessments that other universities require you to take as well for, for, their, for their courses. So that's what I mean by additional requirements and additional information. We ask for this because it gives us even more information than we would ever get through just your UCAS application, just that what you submit through UCAS. Um, we want to have a complete and accurate picture of you. Uh, we want all pieces of the jigsaw, basically. That's the analogy I like to use. In the uh, session that is about making competitive applications, which will be um, in the summer, we will look more closely at all of these different elements. But essentially what we're looking for in all of the things that you submit to us um, are three things. And all three of these things are academic criteria. So academic ability, academic potential and academic curiosity. And we'll go into a little bit more detail about how, um, how you can demonstrate those ones in, in those three academic criteria, I mean, in these bullet points now. So what we're looking for, um, students that have this real enthusiasm and natural curiosity and aptitude, uh, you know, and an ability as well for their chosen course, their chosen subject, and students who have core knowledge, you know, sound knowledge of, of their subject, um, key information, key data and facts, and also 
particularly for things like maths and languages, a technical fluency as well. We're also looking for students who are within their cohort in their sixth form college or in their school, whichever school or college that, may, that might be. We're looking for the students who are the most able and the most committed within their own, uh, their own cohort. Students who take the initiative to delve further. This is what I mean by the super curricular exploration, the subject exploration, the reading and exploring and thinking around your subject area. That's what I mean by taking initiative to delve further. And in the webinar that is dedicated to supercurricular exploration, we will go into more detail about how you can do that most effectively. Um, we're also looking for those students who have strong performances in their, their public examinations and indeed their mocks as well within school, their internal exams and students who are anticipating that they will be at the top of their cohort um, and achieving grades which will exceed our typical offers. Um, for typical offers, you can look on the course pages for each of the courses to look at the sort of the, the minimum um, offer requirements that we, that we have for each of those. It ranges uh, at Cambridge and Oxford from A star AA to A star A star A broadly, but um, there are, more details on uh, the, the minimum offer levels for each of our courses if you look at the course pages. Um, we're also looking for students who are able to think critically about their subject so they don't just expect to be sort of spoon-fed information which they then regurgitate horrible uh, analogy I'm painting apologies <laughs> um, in an exam or when asked a question but they're able to really think analytically and think for themselves and think and learn independently as well. They have questions that they want to ask um, about their subject that they are most interested in studying. Students also with a capacity to thrive when there's a demanding workload. So at Cambridge at Oxford, typically you can expect 40 to 45 hours a week to uh, be, be for the contact hours. So those lectures or supervisions or practicals, whatever makes up that student timetable example that I showed you earlier for humanities and for sciences. That's what I mean by contact hours. And coming into that total of 40 to 45 hours a week is also self-study as well. Um, and then we're also looking for where appropriate um, vocational commitment. So this is for, as I said before, medicine, veterinary medicine typically, what is not important and irrelevant, uh, actually, um, we're not going to factor the following into our admissions decisions. People with a particular personality or lived experience or background, people who come from a particular type of school or anyone's extracurriculars that are not relevant to the subject or course that they want to study. So if you're an amazing musician, that's, of course, relevant because you might be studying for music. So that's relevant if you're a music applicant. But if you're a fantastic sports player, that isn't a relevant extracurricular for maths, let's say. Doesn't mean that our students aren't really well-rounded individuals who have lots of extracurriculars that they take with them into university and indeed pick up while they're here at Cambridge. But in terms of our admissions decisions, they are only ever going to be based on those academic criteria um, and all of these factors that I've listed on the slide here. So finally, I believe, I believe, I believe, which leaves me hopefully with 10 minutes for questions. Um, application timeline. So putting all of this into context for you, we will come back to this slide in the later sessions which focus on the application process. But essentially, what you should be doing in the run up to and during year 12 are these first three steps, really thinking about your course decision. So it's thinking about what subject you are going to study, basically, which one are you going to pick? This is a long decision process. You may actually end up studying something that you didn't think you would at the start of this decision process, maybe at the start of year 12, for instance. Um, but this is why I've got them in this blue box. Um, it's not just a one, you know, one off action where you wake up, you decide and that's it. Um, I wanted to demonstrate that these are uh, more of a sort of ongoing decision process. 
Um, just something about college choice. Um, so the page that I mentioned earlier that was linked on the slides, which has the factors to consider and factors to not consider when choosing a college, just wanted to make a, a further point on that. When you're making an application to Oxford or to Cambridge, um, you have the option to put your preferred college so if you like a particular college, then you can put that, um, uh, you can declare that college preference, as it were, um, in your application. What that means is, is you will be assessed first and foremost by the college that you have put down as your preference. Um, what might happen is that for no rhyme or reason, it's different every year, there might be loads of really competitive applicants for the course that you've applied for at the college that you've picked as your preferred college. If that's the case, we don't want to be in a situation where we're only able to take, let's say, 10 students, just pulling a number out of the air for a particular subject. But we have 15 really strong students overall um, that we would like to um, you know, consider for this course. What we will do is we will put those really strong students that we don't have a place for in something that we call the pool, the winter pool. It's a metaphorical place. Um, it's not an actual um, body of water um, and then other colleges who for whatever reason that year for that particular course didn't get a really large uh, applicant field so they're still looking to fill some of their places with with students that would thrive at Cambridge for that course whatever it may be so those colleges would then uh, fish those applicants uh, continuing with the metaphor would fish those applicants out of the pool and they might end up making that applicant an offer so you you don't you can make that course choice doesn't mean that you will definitely end up at that college if that makes sense if you do get an offer um, from Cambridge and equally when you are at point of application you can also choose to not make a college choice you can choose what we call an open application instead now neither choosing a particular college or not choosing a college at that point of application neither of those um, choices that you can make will advantage or disadvantage you at all in terms of the application process. Um, it, it, it just won't. It's a common misconception that if you apply to a particular college, it might be easier or harder for you to get in. Or if you choose an open application, that might impact your, your chances either way. I, you know, I've been on the student room. Um, <laughs> I've read things like this and people have, have, have asked me about this. Um, it doesn't at all. When you uh, apply through an open application, your application will then be allocated to a college to assess. And ultimately, our decisions are about your course choice and your commitment and ability and that right fit between you as an applicant and that course that you've chosen. College choice is a personal one for you. Um, it's always going to be, in terms of our admissions decisions, it's always going to be about course, your subject um, commitment, your that subject choice that you've made. Um, then finally, sorry, I am running out of time, so I will try and speed run through the rest of these steps. The admissions assessments, just to touch on them briefly, that's point three, step three in the timeline. Um, essentially, some of the pre-registration required admissions assessments, these large ones that um, you also take for other university courses that I mentioned before, um, like the LNAT, for instance, you need to make sure that you've registered for those sorts of tests, these admissions tests. And so it's really important, I think, that when you're in year 12, you have a look at when the registration deadline is, because it's often before you have to submit through UCAS. So it's really important. That's why I've put one as step three and the other as step four. So that early UCAS application deadline is that mid-October deadline for Oxbridge courses. But actually, there's another deadline even earlier than that, if you have um, some of those particular admissions assessments. So just, uh, just have a look to make sure you know when you need to be registering to take those. You would then afterwards in October and November be completing uh, additional application forms. You would be taking your admissions assessment. You would be submitting samples of written work if those things are required. Then if you are shortlisted for interview, um, that would happen in the first three weeks of December. And then finally in January, uh, yesterday actually, was the uh, the day when we, we communicated to our applicants about our decision. So that was decision day. Um, so that happens in, in, in January for Cambridge. Happens slightly earlier, usually for Oxford, I believe. Um, so it looks like, if you're looking at just step four to step eight, it looks like it's quite a compressed timeline, right? Because it's mid-October to January. That's over in a flash. You've got Christmas in between that. So it's over in a flash, but actually, 
the blue ones at the beginning, steps one, two, and three, these are things that you can start doing now, particularly if you're in year 12. Okay, so just to give you a, a little uh, teaser, which I already gave at the start, but coming up, we have the student uh, panel. So please come next time prepared with questions to ask our lovely undergraduates. And then we have those focus sessions on subject choice, super curriculars, careers and financial support as well. And then the final two in June and July for year 12 students that are really focused on um, making competitive applications and personal statements. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop the recording here um, and I will now take questions. Thank you. <laughs>